and God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of the Lord was hovering. And then the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light. And there was light. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot extinguish it. Because it's from God. And it's holy fire. And Lord, we pray that holy fire would ignite our hearts. God, fire from heaven. And God, that would be the light that shines in the darkness that the darkness cannot extinguish. And God, so we give you this day and we pray, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Well, the, the topic of our morning is speak. And the message is, speak, Lord. Last night, it was stand. And where can we stand? And as David said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So, child of God, we need to make a choice. We need to stand where the Lord is. We need to walk in his ways. We need to trust his heart for us. We need to step into it and be who God made us to be. So who has their Bible today? A few hands. <laughs> who doesn't have their Bible? Who doesn't have their Bible? There's some Bibles in the back. Good girls, I love it when everyone has the Word of God. I stand on the Word, the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand on the Word, the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. There's a, a, there's a society called the, the uh, Bible Research uh, society and they did a uh, survey a few years ago and they surveyed people around the nation from ages 8 to 80. They surveyed 40,000 people and this was the quest that they wanted to know. Does reading the Bible make a difference? And uh, so they wanted to know. So they, they asked people, how often do you read the Bible? Do you read the Bible once a week, twice a week, three times a week, four times a week? And they were, they were astounded that they discovered things that they never thought they would discover. They discovered that some people read the Bible once a week. And that would include things like going to church. And the pastor reads a verse and that would be your one verse for the day. Or you listen to a podcast and they read a verse. And that would be your one a day. And, and so they asked people that read it once a day, influenced once a day, uh, once a week, once a week, does it make a difference? And, and they were astounded to say, no, no, no difference. It wasn't a blip on the, on the charts. How about twice? How about twice? If you pull one of those little verses out of the daily bread and read a verse twice a week, does it make a difference? They, they discovered, really, no. But at three times a week, they, they, they saw a little blip on the chart. At four times a week, it shot off the charts. And how did it shoot off the charts as far as making an impact in people's life? If people read four times a week, that means they were opening their Bible and seeing what God had to say to them. And those people that read at least four times a week, they were 30 times less lonely. Wow. I'm telling you, we live in a lonely world. We live in a world that we feel that we are isolated. And what's this COVID thing about? Isolation. Divide 
and conquer. That is the devil's workshop. But if you're reading four times a, 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 a week, you're, you're putting a, a knife in the enemy's heart. Well, how, how else? How else? Uh, feeling significant. Feeling like your life is important 30 t times less, less likely. How about alcohol, drugs, substances, 40 times less likely. How about feeling like there's meaning of life? 50 times more likely. And how about influencing others? 52 times more likely to share your faith and to disciple others. I'm telling you, that rocks. That rocks. We need to be Bible girls. We need to say, God, you speak to my heart. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let's pray again, Lord. We just pray, God, that as we open our Bibles today, that we would feel like fireworks is coming out. That you yourself are personalizing a message that is profound to us, lifting us out of the depths of despond and setting us on the rock that's higher than us, where we can have a clearer view. It's not so foggy and the air is clear. God, because your spirit is feeding us and we're hungry, Lord, for that. We're hungry for truth. And we pray in Jesus' name. And they all said, amen. Well, we have two texts today, but I'll start with, um, I, I just feel the spirit of the Lord is, is here because one of my favorite songs was written by Fernando Ortego, Tega, and it's in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And that became my theme song one year, just give me Jesus. And I played it about a hundred times, a hundred times, sometimes in a week, I just play it over in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Be still. We need to in, be intentional in our life, not just living randomly, being pressed into by the, the tyranny of the urgent. We need to be intentional. We need to have a quiet place. We need to have a secret place with God. Be still and know that I am God. That is God saying to you, you know what? He wants you all to himself. He wants to build you up. He wants to show you that you do have purpose in your life. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. What is the Christian life? God himself says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That is the Christian life. That's not, it, the Christian life isn't just being a good girl. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to stay out of trouble. I'm trying to, to um, separate the truth from the lies. I'm trying to do the right thing. You know what? You can't by yourself. John 15 is, I've worn out John 15 in at least four Bibles. The pages are raggedy. And if you would turn with me to John 15. John 15 is holy ground. It is holy ground. And if you know, if you know the context of, of John 15, you know that, that G Jesus has just concluded the Last Supper. And his disciples did not understand the context. They did not understand his purpose. They did not understand the cross. They were looking for him to set up his kingdom right then and there. And they would be part of it. They would be part of his team. But when he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you, and handed them the cup, this is my blood. This is my blood. And what is the power of the blood? Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Jesus' face was set like flint. And for the joy set before him, 
he intentionally endured the cross because you know what? That's the price that he paid for you. That was the shot heard round the world and throughout eternity that he would set you free. And child of God, you were expensive. You were expensive. Let no one belittle you. Let no one put you down because God Almighty created you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want to say to you on purpose, I don't care what, what your parents think about you. You were a planned pregnancy. There's no accidental birth on this planet because you were knit together in your mother's womb by the master of the universe. He's the one that made everything. And that's why I'm crazy about creation. Again, seeing his fingerprints. Last night we talked about the big whale, the big blue whale with veins so big that a grown man can swim through his veins. But I like it that God likes little things. I like that, that he's in the little details of the life. And I'm crazy about hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are my mantra. I feed them. I have thousands of hummingbirds in my backyard. I'm telling you, my backyard is their home. I love them. They are tiny. Did you know that a hummingbird cannot walk? Can't. It can only fly. Love that. Love that. They are tiny. They are so tiny that one of their enemies is an insect. <laughs> the praying mantis is their enemy. They don't worry about foxes or snakes because a fox can't catch a hummingbird. Oh my goodness, no. A hummingbird can hover. It can power dive. It can fly forward. It can fly backward. It can fly up. It can fly down. It can fly sideways <laughs> and even upside down to escape its predators. That's glory. But it can't float with its wings held still. It can't keep still. It has the most rapid wing beats of any bird. Its heart beats 120 times. No, no. Its heart beats 1,260 times a minute. Wow, that little thing is going. I'm telling you, all hummingbirds weigh less than an ounce. Some only two grams. Its brain, though tiny, is the largest proportionally of any bird. It's smart. In migration, some, some hummingbirds can travel 500 miles without stopping. I'm telling you, they're committed. And how do they do it? On one gram of stored fat. This is a tremendous fuel efficiency. The eggs are so small, only one half inch, and they weigh only one half gram, one fifty-fifth of an ounce, their eggs. But when they hatch, child of God, a hummingbird flies. A hummingbird flies. You know what? Everything that God does in creation is a message. It's a message. The heavens declare the glory of God. The earthworm declares the glory of God. The hummingbirds are his masterpiece. What other things does God do in creation? Frogs are a masterpiece. They may not look like it, but some frogs can be frozen solid, then thawed, and they're fine. <laughs> wow. There's a frog named the poison arrow frog. It has po enough poison to kill 2,200 people in one frog. 
Hmm. Don't underestimate. <laughs> oh, what else do I have here? Okay. Ants don't sleep. Ever. That's why you wake up and you've got ants in your kitchen. I've done that lately. Uh, a worker ant lives seven years. And some ants can live 15 years. But ants are blind or nearly blind. But they're guided by smell and taste and touch. An ant is able to carry 50 times its weight. This is the equivalent of a man lifting three automobiles at the same time. So if you feel small today, a little eye contact, knock it off. Knock it off. Just knock it off. God, speak, for your servant is listening. The heavens declare the, the glory of God. God speaks through all the creation. So what uh, is the Christian life? It is draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God says, call upon me and I will answer you. I will answer ordinary you. If you think you're an ant, he'll answer you. He hears your wee little voice even when it's just tears that's calling out to God. Call upon me. And God says, I personally will answer you. And when I answer you, child of God, I'm going to show you great and wonderful things because he's a wonderful God. And what is the definition of wonder? It is far from ordinary. It is intricate. It is hard to just dissect because it has so many layers, so many layers of wonder. That is our great and awesome God. Joe Briscoll said, I would rather have sleep deprivation than God deprivation. And so we need to draw near to God. Psalm 91, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 91. He who dwells, she who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is mine and I am His. That's what I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge. And my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his wings. And under his wings you shall take refuge. So do you have that little booklet that you received last night? I have looked and looked, and I am not sure I can find mine. That little booklet. Let's see if it's in here. I cannot find it. <laughs> oh, you need it, though. You need it. Okay. Sorry. It's a little messy sometimes up here. Okay. So, um, actually, we're going to use another text. I'll give this back. But you need the back of your, of your booklet today. So can you look at with somebody else? I'm sorry. Okay. Look together. Okay. I'm going to have you turn to two. There's two addresses this morning. And, and two addresses are John 15 and they are Mark chapter 1. <coughs> And so we're going to turn to Mark chapter 1 first. Keep your finger in John 15 because we're going to go to bo both places. Mark chapter 1, again, it's a chapter that we have, I have worn out. In Mark chapter 1, we see Jesus in ministry. In verse 20, uh, 20, 32, we see Jesus. Jesus was, was about his father's business. 
I love it. I love it. And you know what? A little eye contact. Is God your father? Yes. Is God your father? Yes. Does he love you with the everlasting love? Child of God, be about your father's business. There's nothing on this planet that will thrill your heart more than being about your father's business. And how do you figure that out? How do you figure that out? At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him, G to Jesus, all who were sick and demon possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And Jesus healed them. He healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. That's the power of God. God is a healing God. And if darkness has been tormenting you, if you feel like you've been hassled and harassed, and you feel like there's dark forces pressing in on you, you step into the presence of God because darkness cannot dwell with light. And what is darkness? Child of God, it's nothing. It's nothing. Darkness is merely the absence of light. Light. When light shines, darkness flees. And when you have, there's something going on in your world, you bring it to Jesus. And whether it's, it's late at night or early in the morning, he is there. And we see that even in his, in his personal, physical being on this planet, he used the small moments. And late into the night, his door was open. And he was saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And they did. They flocked like bees to honey. They could not stay away from Jesus. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. I would have loved to have seen his face on this planet. But you know what? We're going to see him face to face face to face, soon and very soon, soon and very soon. You know, the Bible speaks about the rapture, that there will be a, a, a time when the Lord will shout, and I believe he's just raring to go on it. And I want to say, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> beam me up, Scotty. Are you going to shout soon? And the dead in Christ will rise first. And I think that's right, because they had to die, so they should go first. <laughs> and then we who are alive and well will be caught up and meet him in the air. And then we'll be all shouting together. That's glory. That's glory. That's your destiny. I'm jealous for those that saw him in the flesh, but did they recognize him? You know what? God is moving everywhere. Do you recognize him when he shows up? I'm just asking. And you know when we recognize him? When we're looking for him. Where are you, Jesus, today? Where are you? I want to know you more today. I want to press into your promises. I want to seek your face. And God says, seek my face. And you know what David said? I'm coming. I'm coming. So late into the night, he was about his father's business. Look at, at verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. I'm telling you, he wasn't saying his prayers. He sought the Father. He sought the Father's heart. He sought the Father's presence. That was his passion. He could not run on empty. He needed to connect with his Father. Because the night before, he was drained, I'm sure. Physically, even emotionally. 
but he knew where to get refueled. He would not run on empty. A long while before daylight, and as Jill Briscoe said, I'd rather have sleep deprivation than God deprivation. And this first ch has changed my life, changed my life. And we can run on empty. And in fact, in Revelation, Jesus, the Holy Spirit wrote letters to the churches. And there was one church, the church of Ephesus. And he said, I know your works. I know you're doing good. You're working your fingers to the bones. But sometimes what do you get? Bony fingers. <laughs> Some of you don't know that country western song, right? But yeah, sometimes we're running on empty. And he said, I have this thing against you. You lost your first love. You lost your first love. I'm telling you, nothing will change your life more than being head over heels, crazy in love with God. Because you know what? It's the light that shines. It's the fire that burns. And there's nothing that's a bigger testimony to this lost and dying world when people walk up to you and say, I don't know what you have but I want what you have. Tell me what you have. And then you can smile and say, I got Jesus. I got Jesus. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And let God be true and every man a liar. I stand on that truth. Jesus would not have God deprivation. He needed to connect with his father. My father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know how God's will is done in heaven? When the angels report, when God says, go or jump, you know what they say? How high? How high? <laughs> and I want to say to us, we need to take our orders from headquarters. God is on the throne of the universe. Is he on the throne of our hearts? Is he on the throne of your heart and your day? Getting down to business, getting down to the real world. Do you connect with him? Do you ask him, what is your will for my day? Jesus departed to a solitary place. As I've read my Bible through the years, I've learned to be a morning person. I like to get up between four and five. It's my secret time. You know the early bird? Gets the worm. Yeah. And I want fresh, hot bread from my father. I love the, the smell of fresh homemade bread in the oven. And I can just sense his presence. I love it when it's dark. I love it when the phone isn't ringing. I love when there's not the tyranny of the urgent. And many years ago, uh, when I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord in a Bible reading church. It was called Calvary Chapel. It was a little bitty church in uh, Southern California. And there was a pastor named Chuck Smith. And, and like I told you, my testimony, uh, a, a teacher had told me that there's nothing in this Bible. But the first thing I was told when I was born again, everything, <laughs> all the answers to the secret of life are in this book. God speaking through his wonderful word. And I was taught that I should read the Bible. And I started reading the Bible right away. But the problem is that sometimes I read it like the Ouija board method. You know, I would just go, what should I read today? <laughs> and, and you know, that, that's a mistake. Because you can go like this, and you know, the Bible says, there's a place in the Bible sa that says, there is no God. Oh my goodness. There is no God. 
well, how did that happen that that's in the Bible? But if we read that one line, we're reading out of context. If you just go one line above it, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <laughs> context is king. Context is king. So um, I kind of stumbled around, and I, I feel like I was running half on empty, although I, I read the Bible, but not every day. And I didn't read through the Bible. And then one day somebody came to visit me, and they came down for coffee, left their one-year Bible on my table, and I picked it up and I said, what meaneth this? What meaneth this? And I saw that the Bible was divided into 365 bite-sized pieces. And you read the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalm, and the Proverb every day. And I thought, oh my goodness, that this is a plan. This is a plan. And you know what? If you fail to plan, you can plan to fail. And that's the truth. Child of God, we need a plan. We need to work the plan. We need to step into a plan. And I call this, and so I picked, I picked this up. I bought one right away that very week, and I started reading on that day's date. It starts in January 1st, but it was probably June or something, and I didn't start at the beginning. I started in June. And truthfully, I wasn't able to read all the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Psalm and Proverb every day. But that year, I started reading the New Testament portion. And then that next, that, that year, I read the whole New Testament. And, and there's power in that. And that was about... Uh, 31 years ago. And so for 31 years, I've read the whole Bible every year. But I have a passion for the New Testament, and I have a special passion for the Gospels. For the Gospels. They are the truth of God. They are Jesus. They are Jesus. And truthfully, every, every uh, um, New Year's Eve, is my favorite day, uh, my second favorite day of the year, because on that day, I read the last of the Old Testament, the last of the New Testament, the last Psalm, and the last Proverb, and then I go January 1st is my favorite day, because <laughs> it's a blank slate. When I woke up, wake up on January 1st, I have not made one mistake <laughs> the entire year. It's like fresh snow. I grew up in Missouri, and as a little kid, my favorite day was when you'd wake up and there was fresh snow, no dirt, no footprints, all fresh. That's January 1st to me. And I be began to read the Gospels, Matthew 1 every January 1. And for five and a half months in the one-year Bible, you read the Gospels. And child of God, Spurgeon said, we must read the Gospels, read the Gospels, read the Gospels. So if you're cut, you bleed the Gospels. We need to know our Jesus. We need to follow him around like a puppy. That's what we need to do. I get a puppy this year. When COVID hit, uh, our little old dog, we had to say goodbye to her. And then I had dog envy. You guys have dog envy? Every dog that walked in my neighborhood or that I saw, you can take your dog in stores now. Did you know that? I was jealous. So um, last May, uh, well, last April, I ordered a puppy, but I couldn't pick her up till May. I flew to Oregon to pick her up brought her home. She's a Labradoodle. Oh, yeah. Her name is Honey Bunny. <laughs> Sweetie Pie. <laughs> and you know what? You need to teach your dog two things. First of all, teach him to come. 
teach him to come. Teach him to know your voice. Because for a little puppy, she's, she's all full of adventures and she can go in the wrong places. I got coyotes in my neighborhood. Yeah. So I teach her to come. That's the first thing. But I teach her. She can be in the far part of my yard. And I stand at my door and without saying a word, I have eye contact and she comes galloping like a horse because she knows that I'm looking at her and she comes. She knows the sound of our, my voice. And the second thing you need to teach a, a puppy, don't tug on the leash. Don't tug on the leash. And some of you are tugging on the leash. I'm just saying. I'm saying you know what God wants you to do and you're tugging on the leash. You know where he wants you to go. You know where he doesn't want you to go. And sometimes you just want to tug on the leash. And I just, by the authority vested in me, I'm just going to tell you, knock it off. Knock it off. Sometimes God puts you on a short leash because he loves you. Because he loves you. And he wants to keep you close. I adore my puppy. I adore her. She loves me and I love her. And that's, you think I, I love her more than God loves you? You're the apple of his eye. Let's turn now to John 15 because um, it's an important place. And John, John, the Gospel of John is my life book and John 15 is my life chapter. And he has changed my life many times through this chapter. In John 15, again, Jesus is speaking and it's after the Last Supper. Judas is long gone to do his dastardly deed. He now just has his 11 disciples in the secret place. And he's talking to them from his heart. Within hours, they will be in the garden of Gethsemane, in the garden. And he will have asked his disciples to pray, to bear with him, and they didn't. He said, watch and pray. For the spirit is weak. For the, for the spirit, the flesh is weak. You need to strengthen your spirit. But they didn't pray. They fell asleep. He turned to Peter and he said, you will betray me, Peter. Before the cock flow, crows three times, you will betray me. And Peter said, never. Never will I betray you. I will stand strong. I will stand strong. But he didn't. In the garden, they came with swords and spears to arrest him. And Peter, what did he do? He picked up a sword and he flung it and cut off a little servant's ears. We can't fight a spiritual battle with weapons of the flesh. This is John 15, his words. Before all of that happened, he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch, if you have your pen in place, circle the word in. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit in me, that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken in, in to you. Abide and circle the word in. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit, except it abide in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. 
God is teaching you the secret to the Christian life. All of the Christian life is an inside job. It's an inside job. Over and over again, he repeats the word in. And he shows you some principles that you need to know. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit. First of all, he says one thing. What does he say? He takes away. He takes away. And when we read something like that, we should ask, God, what meaneth that? What are you saying? That means he takes away. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And what does that look like in real life? Well, many years ago, I had a Christian friend and we were besties. I mean, we did everything together. Uh, we, we taught our kids how to walk together. We went to the grocery store together. We did our laundry together. We did everything together. And we were Christians. But you know what? We were not praying friends. We were not in the Bible friends. We were not iron sharpening irons friends. And one day the Lord took her away. Her husband got an opportunity to pastor a church in a faraway city. And uh, they came to my workplace where I was working to say goodbye. And it was a rainy day. I lived in Oregon. It was a rainy day. And as I saw them drive away, the rain was just pouring and the dam broke in my being. And I started crying so hard that I was sobbing <laughs> and crying. And my boss came from the back room and he said, could you go home? No one can work with that. I got in my car, still crying my eyes out. And the rain, it was appropriate. And then the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I'm in this. I'm in this. I'm in this. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And because I didn't have a best friend, one day my na neighbor came across the street and she said, would you like to go to Bible study with me? And basically I said, well, I don't have any friends, so I guess I'll come. <laughs> Wasn't quite as dramatic, but that's exactly how I felt. And I went. And they were studying the Gospel of John. And I remember the very day we studied John 15. And the Lord turned on the lights. And I became a Bible girl. My best friend was Jesus. I opened the Bible every day and I dug in. It was my lifeline. And God changed my life. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And then he says, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Uh, let's read that again. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And when I read that one day, I said, what meaneth that? That doesn't seem right. A branch that bears fruit, you prune it, you prune it back, the good, fruit-bearing branch. What meaneth that, Lord? And as I was reading, I, it was springtime, and I had this rose bush, and um, it was four years old, and it had been beautiful the first and the second year, but now it's all straggly all oh, straggly. The branches were long and just spread out. And now it was spring. It was getting tiny leaves and hardly any flowers. And the Lord spoke to my heart, I want you to prune it. I want you to prune it. And I remembered how you do that in my book. And I took my shears and I went clip, clip, clip. And in five minutes, I cut off four years of growth. Within days, I was called into somebody's office. I had a position at our church, and it was a very important position that I loved. I loved doing what I did. 
And the woman who was my friend said, Debbie, you have done a great job, but I need to give your position to somebody else. It took all the power of the universe that day to keep me from going, (laughs) but I didn't. I didn't. As I drove home that day, the Lord said, I'm in this. I went immediately to my backyard, stood over my rose bush that was exactly this tall, and we bonded. Literally. And again, the Lord said, I'm in this. I'm in this. I'm in this. Lord, speaking to somebody this morning. Lord, speaking to them. When God closes a door, he opens a window. He's a window open God. You just let him have his way in you. You let him be your good God. You let him be the first boy voice, the boss of you. When the enemy comes in and condemns, you just say, you're not the boss of me. I got a God and his ways are perfect. And I'm going to trust him with all of my heart. And I'm not going to lean to my own understanding. Somebody asked me, yesterday, when did you start speaking? And I, I thought back, and then I remembered, it's when I had nothing else to do. <laughs> Somebody said, would you come and teach in the jail? All right, all right, yeah. I'm gonna talk about my book, Wisdom for Women, later. But quite frankly, my book, Wisdom for Women, is the most requested book in the jail. Some people are famous in high places. I'm famous in low places. (laughs) So let's put our hands before the Lord. Abide in me, Jesus says. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And if he's speaking to your heart, and there's something that you need to put on the fire, that's where the fire burns bright. He takes ashes and makes them beauty. And he's asking you today, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. The fruitful branch he prunes. Lord, we put our life in your hands. And God, we pray that you would explode with life, explode with life, that your life would shine bright in us, ignite the fire in our lives so that people will come to us and say, I want what you have in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen. Amen. God bless you.